Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to my September wrap up. Today I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of September. So September was a slightly crazy reading month. I appear to have read 21 books and I don't really know how that happened. Um, seven of those books were unpublished books that I read for work, uh, which leaves me 14 books to talk to you about today. Two of them were books that I've been reading for a while and just like finished off this month. So I think that partly explains it. But yeah, still a surprisingly good reading month. Lots of things to talk about today. One thing I did in the month of September was reread Sanderton by Jane Austen. Um, this is a like unfinished novel by her. Well, it's really a fragment. It's not really a full unfinished novel. We have 12 chapters, we have a setting and some characters, but we don't really have any plot. And the reason why I decided to reread Sanderton is because there's currently a television adaptation um, on ITV and I watched the first episode and I couldn't really remember what was in the book and what wasn't, so I decided to go back and read the original um, before I continued watching the adaptation. I've watched like four or five episodes of the adaptation now, I'm a bit behind, and I remain sceptical. I don't love it. I think it is much more Downton Abbey than Jane Austen um, and while they have taken the setup that Jane Austen left I don't think they've done very Austen-y things with it and I don't think it feels very much like an Austen novel and I also think it's a bit too long like bits of it seem a bit repetitive that's nothing to do with the work. Um, the actual fragment itself, Sanderton, um, a young woman called Charlotte Haywood, travels from where she lives to go and stay with new friends of hers living in the seaside town of Sanderton. It's quite fun, it's quite interesting, but there's not really that much there because it's really just the very, very beginning of the book. But there we go. Then this month I also finished off my reread of Charles Dickens' Bleak House. I have been hosting a read-along of this for the last 18 months. It has been a very long read-along, um, reading it in the original serialised monthly part, as the Victorians would have done. I really enjoyed this reread. Bleak House is a fascinating book. It tells the story of a court case, Jarndyce and Jarndyce, which is a disputed will. The case has been in court for kind of decades and all of these people have kind of grown old hoping for money um, that has never come to them. And we follow two young people who are potential beneficiaries from one of the wills um, and a young woman called Esther who is sent to live with Ada, one of the wards in Jarndyce, as a companion to her when um, Ada and her cousin Richard go and live with their older cousin, Mr Jarndyce. Um, so we follow all of these characters and how they're kind of linked through Jarndyce and Jarndyce as well as many other characters and as usual with a large Dickens book there are a lot of subplots too. I really love Bleak House, I think there are some fantastic characters in it and the plotting is brilliant. Um, Lady Deadlock and Celesta are such amazing characters. Mr Jarndyce, Esther Summerson, Mr George is a real favourite character of mine, Mr Bucket is great, Mr Tolkienhorn must be one of the most terrifying characters in Dickens, he is fantastically done. There are brilliant brilliant characters in here and it is a fantastic novel and I really really love it a lot and I would highly highly recommend it and um, it's really good fun. I feel I should add here and um, for those of you who haven't been partaking in the serialised read-along and haven't watched my final video but are interested in serialised reading, um, I'm not going to be doing another serialised read-along, certainly not for the foreseeable future because I would rather just read Dickens in the space of a month rather than the space of 18 months. I appreciate that's how the Victorians did it and it's been an interesting experiment to read Bleak House and Our Mutual Friend in that manner and see how the Victorians would have originally read those books but I think they're better read in the space of a month myself. Um, I think I enjoy reading Dickens faster more so you know, I don't think I'll be doing another one, but um, if you haven't read Bleak House and you're interested in reading it, I would highly recommend it. Um, and if you want many, 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 many other hours of videos on Bleak House, then I will link my playlist down below um, with all of my discussion videos on the chapters we read each month. This month's Anthony Trollope book was The Duke's Children. Um, this is the sixth book in the Palliser series, the final book in the series, and I really, really loved it. This has been one of my favourite books in the series. I will be doing a whole, like, Palettes a Week um, series of reviews in October, talking about each book in the series, um, but this has been one of my favourites. Probably, like, my joint second favourite with Can You Forgive Her After the Prime Minister. Um, and The Duke's Children tells the story of um, two people mainly, and also their father and their kind of relationship with their father, as well as their 
their romantic relationships. Lady Mary um, wants to marry a particular man, but he is not aristocratic, which her father does not approve of. And then Lord Silverbridge is torn be between two very different women and is also getting into lots of trouble with money because he likes to bet a lot of money on horses. It's a really fantastic book, really, really powerful. The way it looks at like family and familial relationships is done fantastically. The way it explores money and class um, at this point in time is just really, really brilliant. I love Anthony Trollope a lot and this has been, yeah, this is a great one. Next, I reread this tiny little Penguin Black classic. This is Oscar Wilde's Only Dull People Are Brilliant at Breakfast. So basically what this Penguin Little Black classic is, um, is just like, 50 pages of the wit of Oscar Wilde, just like various witty phrases. And basically what happened was I was filming a video for Victober where I mentioned this, um, and then I just read it immediately after filming that video just because I had read like a few lines out from it in the video and remembered like how much I enjoy Oscar Wilde's wit. Um, this is very, very short, it's very silly, it's just like witty funny things that Oscar Wilde has said, um, which I just is very enjoyable and a nice like evening's read. Then one of the audiobooks I finished off this month was The Nostalgia Collection. This is a um, audiobook collection of various short stories by various different authors. So this me and my fiance Nick started listening to back in July when we were on holiday and then we just finished it off this month. Um, so this has a lot of very different short stories in. Some are kind of ghostly, some are detective, some are just like random short stories, um, some of which I knew before and really enjoyed. It was also one or two like extracts from books, um, namely there's like one weird extract from Alice in Wonderland and I don't know what it's doing in there, um, but for the most part these stories were really enjoyable. You know there's some Edgar Allan Poe, some Thomas Hood, some F. Scott Fitzgerald and Mark Twain, some Jerome K. Jerome and E. e. Nesbitt, and these were up and down as anthologies of short stories um, often are, but in general I thought this was really fun and I really enjoyed it and there were some great stories in there, especially um, The Violet Car by E.E. E. Nesbitt was one of my favourites, that was fantastic. Then this month Nick and I also listened to Poirot Investigates by Agatha Christie. This is a um, Poirot short story collection focusing on the detective figure of Poirot and various cases that he is solving, um, narrated by Hastings as the first two books in the series are. So this is the third Poirot book. Nick and I are listening our way through um, all of Poirot is the plan. I really enjoyed this one, there are some good fun mysteries um, and it's nicely narrated and as usual I really enjoy the relationship between Hastings and Poirot. I would say that so far I think I enjoy the Poirot novels more than I enjoy the short stories. Um, which is interesting because in Sherlock Holmes I much prefer the short stories to um, the novels just for a random point of mystery comparison. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this one, it was good fun. Also in the month of September I read this, this is Pseudo Tooth by Verity Holloway. Um, this was on my TBR for August, my kind of clear out TBR, um, and I finally got around to it. I started it just at the very end of August and finished it off in September. This I was sent a review copy of by the publisher Unsung Stories quite a while ago, um, I'm gonna say about two years ago, and I finally got around to reading it. And I have very mixed feelings about this. I really like the writing style, I thought it was really well written. We follow this teenage girl called Aisling who has these weird fits that she can't explain um, and these weird like visions of other people in other worlds. Um, her mum sends her to live with um, her great aunt in order to kind of get rest and potentially um, find a cure for this illness um, which doctors say is kind of all in her head and there isn't actually anything physically wrong with her. Um, and then various weird things start to happen and the weird dreams that she has in her fits sort of start to become real slash she starts to go into her dreams. There is a lot that I like about this, I really enjoyed the premise, I thought the writing is fantastic, the way the kind of other worlds Aisling visits is explored is really really fantastic um, and I really really loved the first half but what I will say is that for the first half of this book I was really confused about what was happening. And I really didn't mind that because I assumed that I was going to be told at some point what was happening and I didn't mind that I was really confused for the first half. But then the second half of the book came and I was still really confused and then the book ended and I was still really confused. And I think there was just too much ambiguity and confusion for me. And while it's an enjoyable read, I finished it and I was like, but I don't really know more than I knew a quarter of the way through um, and that bothered me. So yeah, kind of mixed feelings on this one I guess. Another somewhat strange um, but enjoyable book I read this month was Good Omens by Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. This I listened to on audiobook. I've been meaning to read this for ages and um, because I'm interested in watching the television adaptation um, which came out fairly recently and looks quite interesting and has lots of good actors in. Um, and I have read 
um, a few Neil Gaiman books before which I have mostly enjoyed with varying success um, and I have read only one Terry Pratchett before I really need to read more by him. Good Omens is a kind of supernatural novel looking at the end of the world. We follow Crowley who is a demon and Aziraphale who is an angel um, and they have a kind of long-standing friendship and both kind of heaven and hell within this novel are kind of warring at the end of the world um, and they are expecting Armageddon to come and the world to end and Aziraphale and Crowley who quite like earth and quite like humans don't really want the world to end. So we partly follow them and we partly follow a little boy called Adam who is the Antichrist um, but is actually a bit nicer than he should be considering he's the Antichrist. It's very weird, um, it's really good fun. It's very surreal in a very Neil Gaiman way and it's very funny in a very Terry Pratchett way. I for the most part really enjoyed this. Um, I especially enjoyed the first half and the like last couple of hours of the audiobook. I will say that the middle sags a little bit. Like I think this is too long really for the book it is. Um, I think this could be quite a bit shorter and that you could cut out quite a bit in the middle. I especially thought like Basically, I loved Azurathay and Crowley, and I thought they were fantastic characters, and I quite liked Adam, and I quite liked one or two of the other characters, but there's quite a lot of time spent in this book with characters who aren't the main characters, and even sometimes with people who, like, never turn up again, um, and I didn't really think that was necessary, and I didn't really think that always worked, and I probably would have liked a book that was just about Azurathay and Crowley, and not so much about the other people. Um, but I'm interested to see the television adaptation, because I have a feeling that might focus a bit more on them. Um, and do some different things. So yeah, I enjoyed this one. I think it's a good read, worth a read, but yeah, just a little bit too long in the middle, I would say. Another thing I listened to on audiobook this month, quite an audio heavy month, um, was High Fidelity by Nick Hornby. This is like a kind of like classic rom-com novel, I guess. I've been meaning to read something by Nick Hornby for ages, um, and my library happened to have this on Overdrive, so I thought I would give it a listen. This was written in 1995, um, and it is about a man called Rob. He's 35. His long-term partner has just left him and he works in a record shop he loves music and he doesn't really know what to do with his life now that Laura is gone and so we kind of follow him and what happens in the immediate aftermath of Laura leaving there are a lot of things I really liked about this I absolutely love the narrative voice like it's written so well I can't wait to read more by Nick Hornby because it was such a fun writing style um, and the narrative voice and the kind of characterization and the internal like character exploration the character arc was fantastic i really really enjoyed that i also really liked the way it was about music and also looked at how like people could define themselves by their hobbies which i thought was interesting as someone who has defined myself by my hobby of reading um, one thing i will say though is that it's 25 years old and it is quite dated especially like to do with gender and gender roles every now and then um the main character says something that kind of makes me wince a little bit um and the main character as well I think is slightly dislikable and I think the fact that it's slightly dated made him more dislikable. However I would really highly recommend the audiobook. There's like a 20th anniversary special audiobook um, which was made four years ago um, narrated by Russell Tovey who's a fantastic actor and who I really like and I think the way he acts it and the way he reads it makes the main character really really likeable. Even when he's like being a bit rubbish um, you still do feel for him so I would highly recommend the audiobook especially. And yeah it was a really good read. I'm excited to read more by Nick Hornby and more of his later stuff as well. This month I also read The Girl in the Letter by Emily Gunnis. I've been meaning to read this for ages. This is a kind of um, dual narrative time slip novel um, with a kind of mystery at its core. So in the present day we follow a young woman who is a journalist um, and she is kind of investigating this building that's about to be torn down which in the 50s and previously um, had been a mother and baby home. Um, but not a very pleasant one. One where it treated the women who went there, who were unmarried mothers, um, very, very badly. Um, and our journalist starts to investigate that and realises that her family kind of has some link to it. There are a lot of things that I enjoyed about this. I think a central mystery is really interesting and I liked how it flips back and forward in time in quite a Kate Morton-esque way. I will say that this is more thrillery than I was expecting. Like it's packaged very like a Kate Morton and I was expecting it to be very like a Kate Morton book. And actually it's much more thrillery. I would say it's darker um, than Kate Kate Morton um, and Kate Morton can be quite dark but this is gets like very very dark and, and yeah I think there were a few times where I felt that it wasn't entirely believable and where I just kind of pushed um, my suspension of disbelief just a little bit but yeah I did enjoy it overall and it was a fun read. 
Then I also read A Sky Painter Gold by Laura Wood, and this is a historical YA novel. It's set in the 1920s. We follow a 17 year old girl called Lou. Her father is a farmer. She lives in Cornwall, um, and she lives a fairly ordinary life um, when one day these very, very rich, wealthy people move into this house nearby um, and start to throw these amazing parties. They're like proper. 1920s bright young things um, and Lou Gaither kind of gets swept up in their lifestyle and in them. I have slightly mixed feelings about this. I really enjoyed it. Like I think it's a really really fun read um, and the characterization is done really well. I think the exploration of the historical setting and the way that it's looked at is done better than I was expecting. I was a bit worried towards the beginning that it wasn't going to properly address like certain social issues of the 1920s um, and how society was different in the 1920s. There were a few bits near the beginning where I was like is this just going to be like a contemporary world with jazz but it wasn't. I actually think there were some things in here that were dealt with really really well but I don't think I think it could have been dealt with slightly better. Some of the historical elements um, for example like there's a lot in here about money and the way the amount of money people have kind of sets them apart but I don't think there's enough about class and actually I think in the 1920s class is more important than money um, to a certain extent. For example like Lou is a farmer's daughter and she ends up spending time with these people who are incredibly wealthy, very very rich and she talks a lot about like not having enough money to dress the same as them but it's never addressed that like she'd have a really different accent to them um, and she'd have had a very different education to them like money is talked about a lot but I don't think class is talked about enough so I think the like history behind it was done pretty well but I don't think it was done fantastically the other thing I would say about this book and especially the ending is that it's very much a YA novel and I don't know what I was expecting and what I mean by that. I can't fully work out what I mean by that but I knew this was a YA book going into it but I think because it was set in a historical period I think I thought it wouldn't be as YA as other YA books and I don't even know what I mean when I say as YA except that there's a point in this book where it has like a false ending. There's a point where it could end and I really wanted it to end there and I think it would have been a brilliant fantastic book if it ended there but it didn't end there and more stuff happened and I think if this had been an adult book not a YA book it would have ended there but it didn't um, and what I did I did really like the ending like I still found it really satisfying but I wanted it to end a bit earlier at a different point where the situation was very different um, and I think I would have found that more believable and more powerful and I think the reason why it didn't is because it's a YA book and I don't really know how to explain it better than that. I still really liked it, I would still highly recommend it, it's a really good fun read um, but yeah I kind of wanted it to be a slightly different thing than it was. But I saved the best three till last. I have three fantastic historical fiction books I want to talk to you about finally which I also read in September. One is Bellman and Black by Diane Setfield. This was a reread for me, my second read. This is a fantastic book by my favourite living author um, and this is set in the late 19th century roughly um, in Britain. We follow a man called William Bellman um, who starts off life working in a mill and ends up kind of going on to open this impressive emporium of mourning wear and kind of funereal wear and everything to do with death and all through his life he is kind of haunted by death um, and particularly by this kind of mysterious figure who may or may not be some kind of ghost. It is fantastic, I love it a lot, um, I think it's a really really powerful book. So interesting the way it looks at like death and mortality and the way the Victorians thought about death. It's such a brilliant read and I would highly highly recommend it. Um, it's ambiguous and mysterious and wonderful and powerful and I love the characterization and as always Diane Setfield writes amazingly. If you have read this book or if you joined in with the read along that I was running in September I will leave um, my video that I made on it down below. Um, it does contain lots of spoilers though so don't go watch that video unless you've read the book but yeah I would highly highly recommend this. It's a fantastic novel. Then I also read Salt Creek by Lucy Trelaw. This book was um, sent to me in my like book subscription box um, from Mr B's Emporium of Reading Delights in Bath um which I had for three months and I have to say they did very very well on this one. I gave them all my bookish taste and they gave me a book that is exactly my bookish taste. This is set mostly in the 1850s and 60s in Australia um, and we follow this woman who is kind of looking back on her life in Australia now that she has moved to England um, and looking back on what it was like to live in Australia as a kind of settler in the 19th century. This book looks fantastically at family and the position of women within the 19th century. It also looks 
absolutely brilliantly at relationships between settlers and Aboriginal people in Australia. Um, like really, really fantastically done, I think, um, and very believable in the way everything plays out in this book. It's incredibly moving and incredibly powerful. Um, basically, this young woman, Hester, and her many siblings live with their parents in kind of the middle of nowhere and slowly but surely um, their numbers kind of whittle down through to people leaving or deaths um, and tragedies and it goes from being not that great at the beginning to getting worse and worse and worse over the years, becoming more and more claustrophobic, people becoming worse and worse. Her father is a fantastically drawn character, um, so so well done and so fully explored and all of the characters in this, like all of her siblings, there's a lot of them and they're all so complexly explored and so brilliantly done like it is really really fantastically done i was so so impressed i love this book a lot definitely one of my favorite books of this year definitely a really fantastic historical fiction book i'm so glad i read it um it was um, absolutely amazing so i would highly highly recommend this it's such a powerful such a brilliant historical fiction book and then i also read god's children by malby roberts this is a review copy which was kindly sent to me by the publishers hollow press i have to say this is one of the best books i've ever been sent for a review and i didn't ask for this one they reached out to me and just asked me if i wanted it and it sounded great and it's amazing um, and I'm so glad that they gave me a copy and told me about it and I want to tell you about it because it was fantastic and um, yeah genuinely one of the best books that have ever been sent. So this um, book is based on the true story of a woman called Kate Marsden. Kate Marsden was born in 1859 and lived on into the 1930s um, and she was a nurse in the 19th century. She's from England and um, she traveled the world as a nurse um, focusing her efforts on trying to find a cure for leprosy and trying to relieve the suffering of people who had leprosy and she ended up living and working in New Zealand, um, in Russia, in America, um, in France, like traveling the world um, and trying to help people. Um, and this book is a fictionalized account of her life and examines her work and her working life as a nurse, it examines her religious life and her relationship with God. She's very, very driven to do as she does by feeling that she um, is working for God and kind of doing God's will. Um, her religion is very, very important to her. And this book also looks at how she was kind of discredited um, and how a lot of scandal was attached to her later on in her life to do with the way that she used funds she had raised for her um, missions to find cures for leprosy and to kind of build hospitals and things like that. Um, and, and also how there was a lot of scandal attached to her and her relationships with women. There were two things especially about this book which I think were handled absolutely fantastically. One is the fact that this book um, has at least three, possibly four, like different narrative strands at different time periods and it flicks backwards and forwards between Kate's life as an old woman in a nursing home, um, her life in New Zealand, her life in Russia and other type points in her life as well. Um, and somehow, despite the fact that it keeps on flicking backwards and forwards in time, you always know where you are and you always know whether what you're reading came before or after the last thing and I don't know how it's managed like it is absolutely masterfully done um to pull that off is a really really difficult thing and it's pulled off fantastically in here like Marby Roberts does a wonderful job um and that was fantastic the other thing in this book that I thought was absolutely fantastic is the way that it looks at Kate's sexuality um and her relationships with various women I've mentioned before on this channel that I really really enjoy um historical fiction with LGBTQ plus characters partly because I read a lot of classics and it's nice when I read a historical fiction book set in the past for it to explore themes that aren't dealt with in books that were actually written at that time. I'm going to link in the description down below a video I made back in February on great historical fiction novels with LGBTQ plus characters. But like I've read a lot of historical fiction set in the past that looks very fantastically at how it would be to be queer in the past because of how the world would view you. But I don't think I've ever read a book that deals so fantastically with how difficult it would be to be queer in the past because of how you would view yourself. And the way this book looks at the conflict within Kate of loving women, but also being an incredibly devout Christian who believes that it is morally wrong for her to love women. And um, that was so nuanced and so fantastically explored and so believable and so well done and so powerful and moving and just like, yeah, this was fantastic. This was, yeah, one of my favorite books of the year so far and really, really powerful. I feel like I'm tearing up as I talk about it. Like this was really, really good guys. Would highly, highly recommend. Um, this was a really fantastic historical fiction book and yeah, 
I'm very, very glad I read it. So those are all the books that I read in the month of September. Quite a good reading month. And um, you know, if I read the amount I read this month in October, I could get through my whole TBR, which would be pretty exciting, but we shall see how it goes. Anyway, that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know down in the comments if you've read any of it these books and what you thought of them or if you'd like to pick up any of them now and that's all thank you so much for watching and i'll be back very soon with another bookish video